show. Let's do the visualization <laughs> of the merit field. And ourselves surrounded by all the sentient beings. Who all want happiness and not suffering. And are very confused about the way to find that happiness. Let's get in touch with our sincere motivation for following the spiritual path. A motivation that seeks the truth, that wants to understand reality, that wants to be of great benefit to others. And let's get in touch with that motivation frequently and not let it get hidden by our very busy daily activities, but to always recall what is important and what our priorities in life are. And if we do that, it becomes much easier to be kind to others because we see that competing with them or harming them isn't in accord with our deepest values and what we want to do with our life. It becomes easier to work for their benefit because we're not in competition to be better than them or have more than they do. So we become perfectly content to work for the, other, the welfare of beings, regardless of whether they praise us or harm us. So get in touch with that motivation inside yourself. Find that bodhicitta motivation. Wanting to fully develop your qualities and purify your mind so you can be of the most effective long-term benefit to all beings. And let's make that our motivation for sharing the Dharma this morning. So even though sharing the Dharma this morning may last an hour and a half, two hours, it becomes something very worthwhile because of the motivation.
So remembering this motivation, remembering what's really important in our life um, is so important because the pull of the eight worldly concerns is very strong. And it's very easy for our mind to get overwhelmed by thinking about material things, by seeking praise, by seeking a good reputation, by seeking sense pleasure. Yeah. And uh, very easily our attention gets distracted to that. And also getting upset when we don't get it. Or when we get some of those things and then we lose them again. But if we re- really remain centered on our mo- real deepest motivation, then uh, that doesn't happen. You know, and we can practice uh, consistently. So I say this because there's so many sneaky ways the, the attachment to only this life functions and sneaky ways in which our self-centered mind operates. And so it's very, when you really think deeply about it, okay, what does being a Dharma practitioner mean? And, you know, especially for people who are monastics, what does being a monastic mean? Okay. And I think what it means is you are very clear about uh, your spiritual quest, your spiritual journey, your wish to benefit sentient beings and to thereby understand reality, generate bodhicitta, and so on, so we can be of the greatest benefit. And so everything in our life is framed around that. Yeah. So being a Dharma practitioner doesn't mean... Uh, It's not a career, and it's not a profession. So you don't want to be a Dharma practitioner or a monastic so you can be a teacher, so you can be a translator, so you can uh, counsel people, so that you can build temples, so that you can become famous and be interviewed in many magazines and even appear on late night shows, you know, um, that that's not, you know, why we want to be spiritual practitioners. And yet it's so easy because we've all grown up in regular society where we're expected to have a career, we're expected to make some kind of name for ourselves in whatever small group we're a part of, in which we're expected to uh, be successful in terms of having money and prestige and whatever. And so it's so easy uh, for our minds to, to veer off from what is really important to chase those other things. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I think it's very important to maintain that motivation strongly. Yeah. And to don't not think that what we're doing is a career choice or a professional choice or something that you, uh, oh, it's Dharma, but I can still support myself. Um, and I can still be famous, and I can still whatever all this stuff is. Yeah, Um, because that just contaminates what our practice is. Yeah? So what always comes to my mind when, you know, the question comes, what does it mean to practice Dharma, is that story about, I forget if it's about Dhamdhampa or Lama Atisha, who was watching the the man uh, circumambulate and say, oh, it's very good you're circumambulating a stupa, why don't you practice the dharma? You know, so then he started doing prostrations and, you know, the lama said, but, well, that's very nice, but why don't you practice the dharma? So then he started reading scriptures 
Well, I'm against how, oh, very nice, you're reading scriptures. How about practicing the Dharma? And finally, the man was just like, well, what is practicing the Dharma? You know, I thought I was doing it. I was doing all the external things that I thought were practicing the Dharma. Why are you telling me that they're not? Okay. And, and then Lamatisha said, it means foregoing the eight worldly concerns. Yeah. It, for, it means, you know, transforming your mind and releasing, you know, all these, the self-centered attitudes, all the uh, grasping that we have. Okay. So it means that. And so to really re- remember that and keep that in our mind. Yeah. Otherwise, our practice gets confused, we get even more confused. Yeah, like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Yeah. And, and then, so, so then you say, oh, well, does that mean, yeah, that I have to, you know, close down shop and, and, and uh, go off to the mountains tomorrow, you know? I mean, our forest, our nice, quiet, peaceful forest where you can meditate without any disturbance. Um, Does that mean that that you just quit everything and go there? No, it doesn't. Yeah, we have, because to gain spiritual realizations, we have to do, we have to create a lot of causes beforehand. Yeah, otherwise, again, you know, going off and living simply in the forest becomes another outer display of looking like a practitioner while not necessarily changing our minds. Okay? And what I figured out by, by observing many people in many traditions over time is, I mean, especially in the Mahayana path, it, it's going to take some time. You know, some lifetime, some eons maybe. Yeah, so we have to remain dedicated and very clear. And we may do different things in different lifetimes to create the merit to support going off and meditating in solitude. Okay? If we haven't created that merit, if we haven't, tame the very gross eight worldly concerns we may live you know like a yogi but our mind is not going to be a yogi's mind it's going to be a distracted mind okay so you know if we may if we are true to what our motivation is then how does building a temple, uh, mowing the lawn, um, you know, cooking, washing the dishes, filing, ta- you know, state um, files with the states. How does all of this fit into Dharma practice? You know, on the surface, we say, oh, well, that's just worldly stuff, you know, and so I'm abandoning all these stuff, so, you know, I'm not going to file the taxes for the monastery. I, I mean, we don't pay taxes, but, you know, I'm not going to file any federal papers. I'm not going to cook. I'm not going to clean, you know. Um, all of this is useless. There, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, sit on the cushion somewhere. Um, no, because we need to create the merit you know, with a bodhicitta motivation, how do we do that? By offering service to sentient beings. Okay. And so, you know, all these activities that we're doing are an expression of our motivation of love and compassion for sentient beings. You know, and by being able to do them without seeking praise and recognition, you know, is already going against the self-grasping ignorance that wants to be somebody, not only in the eyes of others, but to be somebody, 
you know, the, that big eye that wants to, you know, run the world. Okay. And so we do different activities in different lifetimes to create different kinds of merit to express bodhicitta in different ways. Yeah. And, uh, and in that way, uh, really prepare the mind, purify the mind, uh, create merit. So going back to the analogy of the mind being like a field, yeah, if you want to plant good crops, you have to take out all the napweed, all the tansy, okay, all the, what was the other one? Spe- Sweet clover, that was the one you picked last week. Yeah, you have to take out all that stuff, plus the the bubblegum wrappers, plus the, you know, the bottles that people throw here and there. You have to take it all out, and then you have to fertilize and water your field to prepare it. Then, you know, if you're if you're doing, uh, you know, deep meditation, it will bear results. Yeah. But if the field isn't prepared, yeah, you can plant all the beautiful flowers, but nothing's going to grow. Okay, so you know this whole thing of purification and accumulation of merit is is quite important. Sometimes it seems like those are are very abstract things. You know, to, to accumulate merit. What is merit? That sounds like the gold stars you used to get in third grade. You know, I, I'm, I'm beyond that now. I don't need to, to, to that kind of stuff. Well, it's not that. It's not gold stars. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's goodness. Yeah, it's positive potential. It's, um, the tendency for, you know, for goodness, and and you know, putting those tendencies, those kinds of seeds in our own mind, yeah, and doing so happily. Okay, so very important to 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 remember this kind of thing. Otherwise, it's so easy. Our practice, you know, it's a career, it's a profession. What's your job? Oh, I'm a dharma, whatever, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's, that becomes your identity. And we're going to... The previous verses that we've gone through in Chapter 8 and the verses that we're going to go through are really emphasizing this point. You know, we just finished a whole section where Shanti Deva is... Uh, saying, why are you so attached to material possessions? Yeah. And then why are you uh, trying to please sentient beings and have a good reputation so much? And saying, you know, that's all useless if you're doing it with that worldly motivation. If you're practicing with a good motivation and as a byproduct you get that stuff but you're not attached to it, no problem. But when having that recognition, you know, praise and offerings, you know, and having that recognition, you know, if that starts to go to your head, then then really we've we've lost the way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we do the death meditation, remember he talks about three things that are valuable, you know. Uh, or, or what aren't, what isn't valuable and what is, okay, what isn't valuable is possessions, okay, uh, you know, an attachment to it. And that includes all the, not just possessions, but all the sense pleasures, you know, and attachment to our looks, attachment to all that stuff. Friends and relatives, people who love us, uh, people who tell us how wonderful we are, yeah, and we're just spectacular people. We love those. Okay, I'll give up my possessions, but I need that, you know, stuff from other people. Yeah. And then our body. 
Now, at the time of death, our body is not going to help us. Okay, so possessions, friends and relatives, our body, attachment to any of those is, you know, is going to hold us back. So Shanti Deva is really going through this because not only, I mean, we contemplate those topics when we're thinking about the death meditation, yeah, and and how the death meditation helps us focus on our priorities and leave the other things aside. But here, those same topics are coming up because attachment to possessions, friends and relatives, and our body also hold us back when we really want to do deep meditation. Yeah, even shallow meditation, they hold us back. I mean, we all know from our own experience, don't we? We sit down and can you do a whole meditation session without something else coming up? Yeah. Or just a little wandering towards, you know, the end of the meditation about, you know, what's for breakfast or lunch or a little wandering of, okay, that's good. I did a good meditation, but my back hurts and my knees hurt. I want to get up and do something else. You know, how often can we really get through something with, yeah, it's hard, isn't it? You know, just even maintaining concentration on the breath. It's difficult. So, you know, that's why we need to start with the things that are easier and really uh, get a lot of familiarity with them. And, you know, because when we establish a good foundation, then building the walls and the roof are much easier. Without a good foundation, you know, if they start putting the Fos wall up and that two-ton roof with the Ganjira on top of it, but there's no footings and there's no foundation to the building... Yeah, what's going to happen? It's, you know, it's not going to be good. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to have one collapsed, very expensive mess. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So, yeah. And, And the importance of doing this and really looking over many lifetimes, this was really brought home to me. Um, by talking with the nun who was the head of the temple and the old folks home where I lived when I first went to Singapore. And uh, she was amazing. I mean, she did so much work in the community to benefit people, you know, supporting the Buddhist groups in the, in the polytechnics and the, and the university, Um, starting this old folks home. She built a huge center so that different Buddhist groups can have activities there. I mean, very, very outwardly geared towards benefiting sentient beings directly in this life. Uh, And she was totally happy doing that. She wasn't going, well, I ordain, but I didn't ordain to like, do all this work and organize these things, you know, I ordain so that I can meditate, you know. No, she wasn't doing these things full of resentment for having to do them, yeah, or saying, it's unfair, why do I have to do it? Somebody else should do this, yeah. She wasn't. She was completely happy and joyful doing this work, yeah, and I thought, wow, you know, that's really a practitioner. Yeah, She still has that long-term view, and she sees what she's doing in this life as supporting that long-term view. And so she does it with a happy mind. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at what she was doing, going, oh, that's wonderful. I wish I could do that, but I... One part of me said, 
that's really bodhisattva work. I don't, you know, that's beyond me right now. Okay. So, uh, just to keep in mind what's important. Okay. So, just to review the last few uh, verses, you know, like I said, uh, Shantideva went through this whole thing of, of um, although I may have much material wealth, be famous and well spoken of, whatever fame and renown I have amassed has no power to accompany me after death. So why be attached to material wealth? fame, reputation, okay? And then uh, verse 21, if there is someone who despises me, what pleasure can I have in being praised? And if there is another who praises me, what displeasure can I have in being despised? In other words, why be so attached to our reputation? And, you know, whether... People praise us or blame us or understand us or don't understand us. Okay. And then this is one of my favorite verses. We went through it already, but so good to review. If even the Buddha was unable to please the various inclinations of different beings, then what need to mention a malicious person such as I? Therefore, I should give up the attention to associate with the worldly. Yeah. How am I ever going to please all these people? Yeah, they have different tendencies, different needs. That's the reality. Yeah. And, you know, Buddhas are able to manifest in different forms to meet the different needs and tendencies and interests of of sentient beings. But us, you know, and then we say, but I'm a Dharma practitioner. Look, I'm wearing these. I'm a Dharma practitioner. I'm practicing bodhicitta. After I've eaten lunch, after I've had a good night's sleep, when I'm warm enough, when my bed is soft enough, yeah, when people say please and thank you, uh, then I am benefiting sentient beings. Oh, and by the way, when they give me offerings too. But otherwise, don't bug me. (laughs) Okay. So they scorn those who have no material gain and say bad things about those who do. Okay, so you're trying to have material gain to be somebody, to f- feel like you're successful, that you're even better than your siblings because you have more money. Yeah. But what happens if you don't have uh, accumulate enough, then they scorn you. If you do accumulate a lot of wealth, then they're jealous and they say bad things about you too. So wh- who are we trying to pr- please? What are we trying to do here? Okay, so how can they who are by nature so hard to get along with ever derive any pleasure from me? Who, and I, Because I too am also hard to get along with. So you put two people who are hard to get along with together, yeah, or you put 20 or 25 people who are hard to lo- get along with together, and then you have a monastery. <laughs> and then you have a rock tumbler. Yeah, and we are chipping off each other's edges. Yeah. It isn't like, oh, I'm so cooperative and kind, easy to get along with, but these other people... Oh. <sighs> Who accepted them to join this place? (laughs) Yeah, everybody should be a replica of me because I am so perfect and magnanimous and everything. Like magnanimous mouse, yeah. 
Sister uh, Christina, you will meet Buddha Bear and Magnanimous Mouse uh, tomorrow night. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so we're on verse 20, uh, 29. You know, then there's a, a few verses where Shanti Deva really talked about why can't I just go and live in the forest peacefully without attachment to any things. So remember, this is chapter 8 of 10 chapters. Yeah. And the last chapter is a dedication. So that one kind of doesn't count. So this is 8 out of 9 practice chapters. So it's not, you know... We should think about it, we should aspire for it, and then we should try and develop the qualities of this life so that we can do this in future lives. Okay, so verse 28, he says, When shall I come to live without fear, having just an alms bowl and a few odd things? like a computer and a tablet, a smartphone, yeah, some warm clothes, good hiking boots, a warm sleeping bag, um, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah. Oh, and by the way, hair clippers. Wearing clothes not wanted by anyone and not even having to hide this body, okay? So... When can we just live with a mind that is free from worldly attachment? Verse 29, having departed to the cemeteries, when shall I come to understand that this body of mine and the skeletons of others are equal in being subject to decay? So having departed to the cemeteries, at the time of the Buddha, um, and even now a few, uh, but at the time of the Buddha, many people would go to the cemeteries to practice because you think of the dead and then it helps remind us that we're also going to die. And having an awareness of our own mortality spurs our practice. It helps us focus on what's important and not get distracted, okay? So you go to the the cemeteries. Also, some people are afraid of ghosts and spirits and things like that in cemeteries. So if you go to a cemetery, it, it calls up, you know, that fear, which is a manifestation of the self-centered mind and the self-grasping ignorance. You see, you know, the self-grasping so clearly as your mind goes, you know, you're sitting in a cemetery. I heard a noise. Oh, maybe there's a ghost. What's the ghost going to do to me? Ah! And the the idea of I, you know, the grasping at I is really strong. Okay. Of course, if you're sitting in a beautiful place with a swimming pool and a nice buffet, and you hear a noise. You don't think like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? It's still just hearing a noise. But in one environment, you impute all sorts of stuff on it. In the other environment, you don't. Yeah. When I lived in Singapore, the, um, the people who live next door to the building that we rented uh, at the end of my stay... Uh, somebody in the house died. And so as they do in Singapore custom, you know, everybody comes over to the house and plays mahjong and, and, you know, cries and wails and and so on for the person who's dead. And I knew the the young woman in uh, in the house. And she was telling me that one day when they were having, you know, during the wake, for whoever it was who died, uh, she was going out to get some food for people or do some errand. And so she was walking through the kitchen and she tripped on a bucket. And uh, 
you know, and then went out and did her errand and came back. And when she came back, uh, you know, all the relatives were like, oh, there was a noise in the kitchen. In the kitchen, there was a bucket clanging. You know, grandma or grandpa, whoever it was who died, you know, they were in there and, th and they made that noise telling us that they're watching what we're doing and, and make sure that, that we're, uh, you know, um, grieving for them properly and making the proper offerings for them. And she tried to tell them, no, that was just me. I tripped on the bucket. They would have none of it. They were convinced it was the ghost of, you know, whoever it was. Okay, so just a, an interesting thing about how we impute things. But, you know, in here it talks about cemeteries. If we go to places where... Um, you know, just because the environment, we feel ill at ease, you know, or terrified or, you know, whatever, then you can very easily watch, um, you know, the self-grasping at the eye and how it, it becomes stronger. Yeah. So this can happen in any kind of environment, you know, if you are... Um, if you're kind of, you know, just a regular simple person and then all of a sudden you find yourself at Mar-a-Lago with, you know, all these ritzy-titsy people who have to pay $200,000 just to become a member of Mar-a-Lago Mar and, and you're with all these people and you feel like, oh God, I'm really out of place, you know, I do not belong here. Yeah, look at the sense of I that comes yeah, there is a solid sense. So it can come in any kind of environment. Yeah. And then we impute things. You know, oh, all these rich people are looking at me. Yeah, they're looking at me with scorn. They think I'm not worth anything. Yeah, it's all imputed, projected by the mind. And we make ourselves very miserable. Okay, when shall I come to understand that this body of mine, this thing, and the skeleton of others are equal in being subject to decay? So what's the difference between me and somebody else's skeleton? It's just a matter of time, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, within, definitely within the next hundred years, all of us are going to be gone. Yeah. Maybe within the next 80 years, all of us are going to be gone. We'll be the skeletons. New people will come here. And then if we're the ghosts, we can appear and say, pick that napweed. <laughs> you know, you think we, we spent so much energy building this Buddha hall for you, you know, just to do a few prostrations here and there. Start doing your nundro. <laughs> okay. Um, no, but really thinking, you know, basically we are walking skeletons. Aren't we? Yeah. If you look at it, one part of the mind goes... No, there's a skeleton inside, but, and that is fearful, but I am not a walking skeleton, and my skeleton is all covered up, and I'm very beautiful. I have skin and beautiful eyes, and I'm so attractive, you know. But, yeah, this body is decaying, and when it dies, it's going to decay really, really fast. And nothing much is going to remain of it. Okay, so they're equal in being subject to decay. And they're, you know, our body is set up. Yeah, unless it is shattered by a bomb or a missile and blown into many different pieces, it will eventually become a skeleton. It's blown into many pieces, and we have many bones all over, and they won't even know whose skeleton it is. Is that important? 
Do you want people to be able to identify your skeleton? Yeah. Do you care whether they identify, if you're blown up by a missile, they, they identify your ear? Yeah. Do you want your friends and relatives to take some part of you home? Yeah. Oh, they died in, in such a horrible, tragic way, but here they are. I have, you know, I have, I have their ear. What a wonderful person. I miss them so much. I mean, is that important to us? So why do we fuss so much about this body when it's alive? Hmm? So Shanti Devi, he doesn't, we already know, he doesn't uh, spare any punches. Verse 30, then because of its odor, not even the foxes will come close to this body of mine. For this is what will become of it. Yeah? So when our body becomes a, a corpse, yeah, I mean, not even our foxes, our foxes, the foxes, yeah, want to come close. It's, you know, a decaying body stinks to high heaven, and it doesn't take very long for it to start smelling, you know, and decaying. And yet it's so interesting, you know, in our countries. Well, in every country, there are so many rituals about the dead and, you know, what you're supposed to do to help the the person who died. But the person who died is no longer there. They're in the intermediate stage. Maybe they've even been reborn. But we're treating the body as if it were the person. Yeah, and fussing about the body, you know, washing the body, dressing it, yeah, putting special objects that the person liked in the casket, getting a nice expensive casket because you feel so guilty about the way you treated them when they were alive. Yeah, but they're not around to get anymore to see the beautiful casket. They could care less, but we feel better. Okay. So it it really makes us think uh, what what is important and why do we fuss so much about the body? Although this body arose as one thing, the bones and flesh with which it was created will break up and separate and separate. How much more so will friends and others? So now he's, you know, last couple of verses, he was talking really about the body, our own body, and how, yeah, I mean, when we die, it's like, forget it. Yeah, are you really attached? Who was it, Nancy Reagan, who had uh, her hair done in the casket? And there was some movie star, wasn't there? We talked about this before, who had a facelift, yeah, Joan Rivers. Yeah, so you're dead, but you want to look good in the casket. Yeah, so you have a facelift, you have your hair done. <laughs> okay, so although this body arose as one thing, the bones and flesh with which it was created will break up and separate. Okay, so this body, when it was born, we call it one body. Yeah, we look at it as one thing. In actual fact, the body is a collection of parts. Yeah, and the the parts can break up. So the bones and the flesh, you know, of which the body was created, they break up and they separate. Yeah, the flesh decays first, the bones hang around for a while. Maybe, you know, the dog chews on them or the coyote chews on them. 
uh, or who knows what happens, um, you know, or the, the body breaks up and it ceases to be one thing. It's the different parts decay at, at different times. There was an exhibition I went to in Cleveland that's going, that was going around uh, the States of showing, maybe some people know the name of it, it was showing the body, all the different body systems in different parts, um, creating them and then showing how they fit together. Some people are nodding their heads, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and so it, it, they would have, like if they were illustrating one of the the digestive system, you would see just the shape of the body in 3D yeah, with all the different organs of the digestive system. Did they use actual parts? They did, didn't they? Hmm? They plasticized bodies. They plasticized bodies. They plasticized, plasticized, the plasticized, yeah, real body parts, and then created you know, and the, it was like a museum, you know, a whole display of different parts of the body and and different systems of the body and how they fit together. And knowing that they were actual body parts, you know, but, but you saw so so clearly through the display how, you know, the body looks like one thing, but you start taking it apart. And there's so many different parts. Yeah. So where is the body? Yeah. Where is the body that we are attached to? Yeah. Is it your cornea? People say the eyes are the what? The eyes are the, the window are the window of the soul, something like that. Okay. So your cornea. There's your cornea, you know, this white stuff. They have it just out on a on the table, plasticized. Yeah, is that me? You know, that's just the white stuff around. You know, the eyeball. So then they have various eyeballs out on the dishes. That's the window to somebody's soul. What do I think of just seeing an eyeball? Yeah. We look at people now, oh, their eyes are so attractive. Then imagine, you know? Here's, here's their eyeball. You get to sit and look at their eyeball all the time. Is it still beautiful? Okay, so the bones and flesh, which covers this body, will break up and separate, okay? How much more so will friends and others? So if the body breaks, the body comes as one thing, it breaks up into many parts. Friends and relatives are already different things. When they come together, of course they're going to separate. They're already different things. Okay, so how much more so will friends and relatives separate? But if you look at at your life, how do we create an identity? You know, part of it is created in relationship to our friends and relatives. Yeah, I am the son or daughter of so-and-so. Therefore, and then there's a whole bunch of things that that means, okay? I am the parent of so-and-so, and and then there's a bunch of things that means. You know, I am the brother, sister, aunt, and uncle of so-and-so. Yeah, more identities in relationship to those people. And yet, and so, so we're creating our identities in relationship to these people. Sometimes... Our, we create identities by whom our enemies are. 
You know, Russia is an enemy. Therefore, I'm a patriotic American. Well, except now you can be a patriotic American and think Russia is great. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, you know, and you think Russia, you think, what, what, do, what do you think of Russia that's the enemy? The dirt? Yeah. Is the dirt the enemy? Yeah. We're in economic competition with China. With the dirt in China? Yeah. I'm a patriotic American. What? I cherish this dirt? This dirt looks just like Russian dirt and Chinese dirt. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, back to friends, friends and enemies. You know, all these things separate too. And yet while we're alive, we, we are positioned and we position ourselves in relationship to all these things and then think we, you know, have an identity and this is who I am. Yeah. And then even when we die, they say, you know, what do they put in the, in the obits? You know, so and so. That's, that's, they use your middle name at that time. So there's two times. Two uh, uh, times in your life, or uh, circumstances in your life, when you, they use your middle name. First, when you're a little kid and you're really in trouble. Have you noticed that? That's when they, you know, who do you think you are, Cheryl Andrea Green? <laughs> yeah, that's how you know what your middle name is when you're <laughs> really in trouble as a kid. Yeah, is this the same for you? Yeah. Yeah. They don't call you by your nickname when you're really in trouble, you know. And when they when they write an obit, then they put your middle name in. Okay? Other than that, you know, our middle name isn't used too much. Yeah. Okay. But we create these identities, you know. Based on the name, too, yeah. Based on the color and shape of our body, based on the health of the body. Um, so many different things we create identities. And yet, all these things are transient and they fall apart. Okay, so our friends and our relatives, um, we're going to separate from all of them uh, at death time. And even during life, yeah? Can, are there people who you were really, really good friends earlier who now you've lost touch with? Yeah? I can think of several people who I was very close to, you know, at different times in my life. And we haven't been in touch in, you know, a long time. I don't know what, what's even happened to them. Yeah, so, of course, these things are going to separate. At birth, this is verse 32, At birth I was born alone. At death, too, I shall die alone. As this pain cannot be shared by others. Okay, so far we understand that. Listen to what the punchline is. What use are obstacle-making friends? I know what use they are. They make me feel good. They give me security. They encourage me. When I die, they're all going to cry and they're going to miss me and they're going to say wonderful things about me. I know what use my obstacle-making friends are. They're not creating obstacles. They're giving me happiness. I don't want to separate from them. Okay. But think about it. At birth, I was born alone. Yeah? Somebody holding your hand when you popped out? Yeah. You may say, well, you know, I was a Siamese twin. We were attached at the hip. But you're still two different people, aren't you? Yeah, probably having different experiences because of the different positions in the womb, even though, you know, you're joined at the head or the hip or wherever. 
At death, too, I shall die alone. So whoever we're close to in our life, when we die, that experience, we go through ourselves. Yeah. Other people can be around us, crying and sobbing and saying, sign here, this is your last will of int- and testament, and you just bequeathed everything to me, so sign here before you die. Um, yeah, still, we're dying alone. And whatever pain we experience, we experience it ourselves. Other people may have similar pain, but we experience it. You know, our karma ripens into our pain. You know, other people's karma ripens into their pain or their pleasure. Or our karma ripens into our pleasurable feelings also. But, you know, these things are experienced alone. So we can empathize with others. We can understand others. Yeah. But others do not accompany us when we go through different events in our lives. Princess Diana, at when they were interviewing her, said there are three of us in this marriage, so it's a bit difficult. Yeah, so in, in her circumstance, you know, we know what's going on, but when you think about it, you know, the, the other, the extra person was a different person having a different experience. Yeah. Okay. So what use are obstacle-making friends? Well, why are we calling them obstacle-making friends? When we die, yeah, we want them all around us as protection. But can they protect us when we're dying? Can they protect us from the ripening of our own tendencies, from our own actions that we ourselves have created? No, we can't. They can't. Yeah. If we have good Dharma friends, the Dharma friends can help us when we're dying. Okay. They can remind us of our refuge. They can remind us of bodhicitta, remind us of the nature of reality. Okay. They can give us instructions, but they can't hold our hand and come with us and do everything for us. You know, they can remind us. And maybe we listen to them or maybe we go, stop telling me what to do my whole life. You've been doing this. (laughs) You know, it used to be, you know, you're on dishes, vacuum the floor, go pull that weed. Now you're saying, you know, remember the three jewels, remember your <laughs> teacher, yeah. take refuge. See, you're always giving me orders, bossing me around. Yeah, who knows how our ignorant mind is going to respond? Yeah, maybe we do that. But if, you, you know, hopefully if you have good Dharma friends, they, you know, they give us instructions why we're dying. Huh? And then that, that is something that's very helpful. But otherwise, I mean, they create a lot of obstacles. Yeah? They're worried about what happens to the property. I think I told you about my, my cousin and my, my aunt, his mother, the morning of the wedding, died in the bathtub. Yeah. So here he is getting married, and his mother just died in the bathtub at his fiancée's parents' house. And during, after the wedding celebration, when there there was food, you know, they canceled the band and all that stuff. Uh, Then my uncle goes to talk to him about, um, I was hearing the conversation about, you know, the property and, and the will and, you know? So that's an obstacle-making friend, isn't it? I mean, in this case, it was making obstacles for, for my cousin. But if you're dying and someone is, you know, saying, 
You know, who are you giving all your Dharma books to? Yeah. We think, oh, I'm a Dharma practitioner. I don't have anything I've renounced. But then you're dying. And, you know, who do you want us to give your Dharma books to? Yeah. What do you want us to do with your robes? Okay, we'll bury you in one set. But but what should we do with the rest of them? You know? And, uh, you know, we need you at the meeting to decide such and such and such. Can you wait and die until after the meeting? Yeah, about the altar. See, it's even you, we need you for we're, we're, we need you for a meeting to make an offering to the three jewels, so you can't die yet, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then, what? Who's going to inherit your cats? Well, the cats belong to the monastery, but I have my own special cat. What are we going to do? Who's going to live with your cat? Who's your cat going to live with? Oh, yeah. Oh, are you bequeathing all your money to the cat? <laughs> to all four cats? We got to share equally. Yeah. And then, you know, your family's calling the monastery. You know, have they died yet? I. <laughs> I want a souvenir from my, my dead brother, sister, son, daughter, parent. You know, have they died yet? I want, I want, you know, their watch. Well, we don't wear watches at the Abbey. Uh, then give me their clock. Yeah. Just tell me when they die and don't do anything else with the clock. I want it as a souvenir. Obstacle makers. Yeah. So the moral is, in your will to say who is getting your clock. Yeah. And if you snuck around all the Abbey guidelines, well, if you have your watch in your pocket, it's okay, but if you wear it on your wrist, then are you really going to have the guts to bequeath it to somebody else? <laughs> Yes, we'll bury it with you. Yeah. Yeah. My dad got buried in, uh, he was a fan of the Angels, yeah, the baseball team. So he got buried in, a, you know, an Angels sweatshirt and pants and Angels cap with a baseball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> but it was very sweet. My my the my former husband, who was very close to my family even after we separated, he had some sand from a Kala Chakra initiation and he put it on my dad's head. Yeah. Of course if dad was living, I don't know if he would have said yes to that <laughs> or no. <laughs> That's Buddhist stuff, you know. I'm not Buddhist. <laughs> no, I think he might. He might have allowed it. You know, he was scared of dying. I think he he would have taken anything. Okay. So at birth I was born alone. At death too I die alone. As this pain cannot be shared by others, what use are obstacle making friends? In the same way, verse 33, in the same way as travelers on a highway leave one place and reach another, likewise those traveling on the path of conditioned existence, meaning samsara, leave one birth and reach another. Okay, so we're like travelers on a highway, and our body is like the guest house that we stay in temporarily. Yeah. So when you are in the guest house, hopefully you aren't getting too attached to it. Although sometimes we get attached to our room in the guest house because if you walk in and somebody else is in that room, 
you get say, get out, this is mine. Okay. Even a guest house. But this body is just a guest house, isn't it? What is that? Verse one, one of the early verses in the 37 practices. Okay, so we're like travels on the uh, uh, travelers on the highway. The highway is samsara. We're in one guest house. Yeah, we move out of that one. We go into another guest house. We move out of that one. We travel on. We get reborn into another one. Okay. So likewise, we leave one birth and reach another. Yeah. Now, if you're traveling literally from one guest house to another, you have uh, five big suitcases, three backpacks, you know, uh, ten trunks full of stuff, and then, uh, you know, everything else you packed up that you're sending by DHL. Okay. Or, or uh, you know, FedEx or something to, to the next place you're going. Okay, so you take all your stuff with you. Now, if you had to walk from one guest house to the other, would you take all that stuff? No way. Okay. If you were getting born, if you were moving out of one body into another body, can you take any of your stuff? You can't even take your body, your old body, into your new body. Yeah, you can't take your friends and relatives with you as you migrate to your new body. Yeah, all your awards you can't take with you. Yeah, what the only thing that comes with you is uh, your karmic seeds and then also the um, tendencies that. Uh, habitual tendencies of virtue and non-virtue that you've created. Okay? So none of the stuff that we argue about during our life comes with us at the time of death. Hmm? Verse 34. So all, all of this is said to make us ask ourselves given that we have to separate from our body and possessions and loved ones when we die, and our whole identity to boot, what is important in our life? Is it important that I win this argument? Yeah. Is it important that I get what I want? And to really ask ourselves those things. And, and when we do, it makes our mind a lot clearer because we realize that so much of the stuff we get all upset about and stressed about and worried about, none of it comes with us at the time we die. And so what real value is it in the long term and especially if death can come in the very next moment, we are not guaranteed to have a certain lifespan, then why are we spending so much time worrying about this stuff? Okay. So let's pause here. Um, if there's questions or comments. Um, Venerable, as a lay person, um, friends are important to be like kind of companions in life. Um, so how to have that aspect balanced and not just mm -hmm. get too lonely or too solitary mm -hmm. or, you know? Yeah. Friends are also important when you're a monastic. Yeah. We all live in relationship to other sentient beings. So the question, or the issue is not, we don't have any friends. 
That's not the, that's not what Shanti Deva is saying. Okay, he's not saying just don't have any friends, because uh, that can be done really out of a, 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 quite an unhealthy rela- uh, feeling inside. If you just say yeah, I don't have any friends, I don't need anybody, you know. Yeah. Um, the question is, how do we have healthy relationships with our friends? That's the question. Yes, we need friends. Relatives come along, <laughs> we, whether we ask or not. Yeah. But how do we have healthy relationships with them? How do we uh, speak to them to encourage their virtue instead of asking them to lie for us or come, cover up things for us? Yeah. How do we relate to them uh, with kindness but without attachment? Yeah. So that we help each other while we're alive, but when the time comes to separate for whatever reason, we aren't stuck together like objects glued together. Okay, so that's the question how to have healthy relationships with others. It's not a question of, I'm I'm independent. Nobody touches me. I'm not attached to anybody. Yeah, what that person is saying is, I have a big wall inside. I don't want to be vulnerable. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's not what Dharma practice is about. Yeah. Because we want to have an open, caring heart without the stickiness. Yeah. But with really the mind that seeks the long-term benefit of the, of the other people. I think the statement that you made, Venerable, that we do, over a course of lifetimes, we do different activities and different lifetimes to express bodhicitta in different ways. If I could really take that to heart, I think the comparing mind, the jealous mind, the insecure mind would be done away with. Yeah. You know, I think it's only when I see the strengths of other people and compare them against my strengths and think that there's something wrong with one of those two things <laughs> that the suffering mind comes up. But to see it in the long term that this life, this is my strengths, that's mm-hmm. their strengths, and to rejoice rather than going, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with them? Mm-hmm. So that's a really beautiful antidote to the comparing yeah. jealous, yeah. insecure mind, self yeah. mind. Yeah. And for me, that's also part of the beauty of living in the community, because there are many things I would love to be able to do, but I can't do them all. But we have people in here with different talents who can do the things that I'm not able to do and benefit the people that I don't have the skill to. And so I can, you know, support them and rejoice at their doing what they're doing without having to compete with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it important to cultivate bodhicitta before considering entering a monastic commitment? Can one truly practice dharma if one hasn't studied enough? Um, Okay, there's two questions there. The first one, no, you don't have to generate bodhicitta before entering... Uh, you know, before taking monastic precepts. In fact, monastic precepts is a prelude to bodhicitta because monastic precepts emphasize not harming, okay? And to generate bodhicitta, we need to be able to stop harming others and in addition to benefit them. So ethical discipline is the first half of that, the, the stopping harm. Yeah, so we do that before generating bodhicitta. Um, that doesn't mean everybody has to become a monastic before they bo- they generate bodhicitta. It's not, we're not saying that, but for people who want to ordain, okay? And then the second part is, can we truly practice if... Uh, if we haven't studied enough. If we haven't studied enough. Enough is a tricky word. I don't know if we can put a demarcation line on enough. 
uh, because everybody is starting off at different points and studies different things. What I can say is, yes, we do need to do some study in order to practice, because uh, if we don't know what to practice or how to practice or how to discern virtue from non-virtue, then what are we meditating on? What are we practicing? How can we practice? Okay? So the study, when the Buddha talked about hearing, thinking, and meditating in that order, so the, the study, the listening to teachings is, is under the hearing one, and that's the first thing we have to do. Yeah. It doesn't mean you only study and you don't contemplate and don't meditate, but you have to you have to know what you're doing. Yeah, I'll put it that way. I mean, if if you're gonna be a car mechanic, you can't just go in there and say, I'm a car mechanic and I'll fix it. You have to learn how a car works. Yeah. So we have to learn something about how our mind works and then look at the mind and understand it through what we've learned about it. Um, this is a question from last class, mm -hmm. last verses, mm -hmm. about um, not getting attached to our reputation and all that. But some careers in life are built for lay people are built on reputation or oh, recommendation. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that that thing becomes like very important. So yeah. how yeah. to understand this in a wise way? Well, you have to ask yourself, why do you want to do a career that depends so much on presenting a reputation and painting a picture of who you are? That's one question, yeah? And then the second question is, can I just do my work and do it honestly, do it correctly, uh, without caring about my reputation, without trying to impress people so that they will come back for more business and I'll make more money? Okay. So it's a lot the pure, you know, purifying your motivation. And if it's difficult to have a really pure motivation, then to, to really say, well, you know, okay, I'm doing this work, but is it really good for me? What's it doing to my mind to think day and night about how I can make a good reputation how, or make a good impression on other people so that they will do business and I'll make more money? That becomes the purpose of your life. Yeah. So, you know, for worldly people, that's important. For Dharma practitioners, they have other things they want to do. Yeah. Because when you die, your business stays here. You go on. Even the business has your name on it. Yeah. Then it stays here with your name. Nobody knows who you are. And, and it really doesn't matter who you are. I mean, we have all these Trump hotels. Does it really matter that they're called Trump? Why are pe do people pay so much money just to have that name on their hotel? Who cares? Clearly somebody cares, but it's not me. <laughs> yeah? I mean... Oh, well, Trump, if I stay in a Trump hotel, then it means I'm an important person. Yeah, well, if that's important to you, then go ahead. But personally, I don't like all that chandeliers and stuff. It's a, it's a little bit too much, you know. And yes, it does impress me, but it impresses me the wrong way, not in the way the person wanted. Yeah. So.
Yeah, we. It, I mean, when you really think about it, it's kind of it. For me, it it pulls at heartstrings. It's like here's a person, and what's so important to them is their name and their reputation. And it's like that to me. That's so sad that somebody lives their whole life seeking that. You know, it's like somebody living their whole life chasing uh, bubbles, you know? It, it's sad. So, But I don't think he wants my business anyway. <laughs> yeah. We'd, we'd set up shop in his... Hotels, bring out all the meditation cushions, Donnie. Yeah. <laughs> design the altar. He'll come and design the altar. <laughs> It'll have his statue in the middle of it. <laughs> I was asking to move the desk to the altar there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yep. Okay, let's dedicate. <laughs>